bet you weren't this good at school, were you? If you are already a fan of the Shelley School, you won't need to be told that Eleanor Brent Dyer's famous fictional school has now been flourishing for almost 70 years. And whether you live in Britain, Ireland, Australia, Zimbabwe or Switzerland, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, the USA, or any of the other places where Shelley School fans are found, you will certainly know already that the 6th of April, 1994, was Eleanor Brent Dyer's centenary. Eleanor's record-breaking series contains 59 stories about the imaginary world of the Shelley School and its characters all published originally by the Scottish firm W&R Chambers between 1925 and 1970. And it's clear the stories quickly became popular while new titles were regularly added to the series. The earlier books had to be reprinted over and over again. There was even a Shelley School fan club, something unique in the history of the girls' school story. This ran from uh, May 1959 until after Eleanor Brent Dyer's death in 1969, its membership then numbering nearly 4,000 fans. Today, the Shelley School hardbacks are no longer in print and they are much sought after in the second-hand market where the earlier titles in particular can often fetch much more money than they cost when new. The stories themselves have always been available because in 1967 HarperCollins Armada embarked on a program of republishing the entire series in paperback and this vast project will eventually be completed sometime during 1995. The fact that today in our world of the 1990s more than a hundred thousand copies of these Shelley School paperbacks are regularly sold each year must surely speak for itself about the continuing popularity of the series. And it was this unquenchable vitality of the Shelley School that first kindled my interest in the idea of writing a book about Eleanor Brent Dyer. What kind of woman, I wondered, had written these amazingly successful books? But answering that question proved far harder than expected. Information about Eleanor was scarce and very hard to find. Indeed, during the five years of hard slog that went to producing behind the Shelley School, my biography of Eleanor Brent Dyer, there were times when only dour Scottish obstinacy kept me going at all. But the task was also fascinating especially when a picture of Eleanor Brent Dyer's complex personality began slowly to emerge. The Shelley School's author turned out to be in many ways so different from her books. For one thing, Eleanor Brent Dyer came herself from quite a humble background. She was born on the 6th of April, 1894, in the Tyneside industrial town of South Shields and grew up there in a modest red brick terraced house with no garden, no inside sanitation, no running hot water, altogether very different from the gracious homes inhabited by many of her fictional heroines. Eleanor came, what is more, from a broken home. Her parents had separated when Eleanor was only three and her little brother Hansel barely two. And because their mother was so determined to hush everything up, it appears that Eleanor's early life took place against a strange background of secrecy and evasion, which clearly had lifelong effects on the whole development of her personality. Her own school days were spent at a small private school in South Shields, where almost certainly the accent lay more strongly on ladylike behaviour than on academic achievement. And Eleanor must, I think, be credited with having done a good deal in the way of self-education during later life, in the intervals of a busy teaching career. This began as early as her 18th birthday, 
and it was eventually to span almost 40 years and to give her a remarkably wide experience of real-life schools. If only I knew what to do with you girls, said Dick in worried tones. Oh, you needn't worry about us, replied Madge. I've got a plan all ready for us. What do you want to do? Start a school, was the sufficiently startling reply. Do you remember that little lake in the Austrian Tyrol where we spent the summer five years ago? TNZ. There was a big chalet there which would be topping. It was not too far from the lake, fairly near the steamer, and yet it was away from the paths. I shouldn't want a large number, not at first at any rate, about twelve at most, and counting Joey. There was a sound of flying footsteps, a thud in the hall, and then Joey, or to give her her proper name, Josephine, fell rather than ran into the room. What am I going to do? I can see it's all fixed. Remember TNZ? Rather. Well, you're going there. Madge is going to run a school in that big chalet not far from the lake. What a simply ripping idea! When are we going? Caroline, Katie, Moira, Elizabeth, Chloe and Alice are members of Friends of the Chalet School, a modern chalet fan club. What made them join? I read the Scorch Chalet for my first book. Um, I had, I'd had it for about a year and I didn't read it. I used to get to the first chapter and then stop and then go through it again. And I was very bored with them. And then I persevered and I read it to the end of the book and I really loved it and I've been hooked ever since. The first book I read was The School at the Chalet, which I was given as a present. And the first book I read was also The School at the Chalet. I had thought that the Chalet School books would be boring before I read it. But, um, my uh, mummy um, bought it for me and I tried reading it and I really liked it and I've been reading them ever since. When I was younger I can remember I'd get to say three Chalet books out of the library and read them through and then straight after that because I haven't got any more books to read I just start rereading them from the beginning again. I started reading the Shelley School books when I was eight was when I read the first book that's full of the Shelley and I really like them but sometimes I go I've got the first ten so far and I've got some more in the other series so I do the first ten and then I go back and read from number one again. Um, I usually go through the books which I have got and then go back to the beginning if I've got time and start rereading them over and over again. I read books nearly all the time and I think Shelley School books are my favourite. I read them uh, almost every day but sometimes I get bored of reading a book too often so I leave it and go back to it a few months later. I like reading the Shelley books because they've got such good characters and there's quite a lot of humour in them and I just laugh when I read them. My favourite character is probably Joe Scott because he's kind of like um, Jo, as she's named after her, but she's also like she also saved Emma and Hope's life. I think my favourite character is probably Madge at the beginning, but then when she changes, I don't like her so much because she seems to age too much. Who's your favourite character? Um, Joey or Len? Or Con? Oh my Or Stephen or Charles or Michael? Felix or Felicity or Cecil or Jeffrey? In fact, most of the Chalet fans are grown up. Anne Mackie Hunter started the club in Australia in 1989. Friends of the Shelley School really evolved through a lifelong love of Eleanor Brent Dyer's books. I really do not remember when I first started reading them, but I would have been about seven or eight years old. I did buy two of them, Exile and Trials, which I brought to Australia with me. But despite searching, even through the 60, late 60s and early 70s, was unable to find any more. And can remember my excitement when I went to college to find out that they were still available. I found that out through the University Corporate Bookshop. And I remember my excitement when I found the very first paperback, The Shelley School and Joe. And that told me that it might be possible at some time to finish the collection. And I eagerly waited for each reprint. And then one Sunday morning, with uh, time on my hands, nothing I really wanted to read and too wet to do the gardening, I decided to practice my very poor typing skills and uh, created my own Shelley School newsletter, the one I've always wanted to read, because I didn't find out about the Shelley Club at the time, although I was reading the books. 
That evening, a friend told a meeting of children's book collectors in Brisbane about the newsletter, and Anne immediately gained 12 subscribers. Soon she had readers in Britain too, among them Jill Bilski. I wrote to a lot of people I knew in England and Scotland who collected Brent Dyer books, um, because I'd been a collector myself since about the age of 10, and had slowly built up a network of other collectors who I knew, um, eventually ending up with me becoming a book dealer and selling the books, as well as collecting them. Um, and so I wrote to a lot of these people, and a lot of them expressed an interest. And so we got a lot of new members that way. And after that, yes, I had leaflets at book fairs. I put adverts in various magazines, such a such as Book and Magazine Collector, and again, like Australia, mostly by word of mouth. Members sort of joined, got the newsletter, told their friends who also enjoyed the Shirley School books, and it all blossomed from there. By 1994, there were more than 300 readers, the majority of them in the United Kingdom. The thing that I've always been against is saying it was based in Australia. In these days of instantaneous communication, and with the international atmosphere that was so much part of um, Brent Dyer's philosophy, you can't say it's based anywhere. The fact that I live in Sydney and Jill lived in Amersham in Buckinghamshire, to me, was irrelevant. Holly Gores and Clarissa Cridland formed the club's centenary committee to celebrate the anniversary of Eleanor Brent Dyer's birth in 1994. What made them do it? Eleanor and her books are still very important to a lot of people. There's a rising generation of children who read them to this day, and the themes in the books are very real to so many members of Friends of the Chalet School. For some of them, the Chalet School is a real world to them, and for something with that important and strong a meaning, then it was only right and fitting that the centenary of the author's birth should be commemorated. Yes, I suppose that just really because the books are still in print and still read, by children today um, and she has created something which is unique um, in the annals of sort of school stories um, and for that reason I think it's important that that we did celebrate the centenary and it also gave the chance for an awful lot of people who didn't know that there was a fan club um, to find out about it through the publicity. And I mean, our membership has more than quadrupled since we started this. Um, and one of the nicest things is that we've had so many letters from people saying, I knew nothing about it, and I'm so pleased to have found you. Mm -hmm. I'm so pleased to find that there are other people like me. Um, so many people thought they were the only ones. They thought they were mad to be still reading them into their adulthood. And People write in and say, I thought I was a nutcase because I've still read children's books, but then now we can welcome them aboard and say, yes, we all do it, and it's a wonderful feeling. The main celebrations took place in April, when 160 fans spent the weekend in Hereford. On Saturday, they met at Eleanor's former home to watch Mary-elect Kit Gundy unveil a commemorative plaque. Can you all hear me? Yes! <laughs> Well done. Teacher training wasn't in vain. <laughs> well, friends of the Chalet School, I'm very proud to have been asked to unveil this commemorative plaque to Eleanor Brent Dyer for all the pleasure she has given to so many of us over so many years. It's only fitting that there should be a permanent memorial to her here where she ran her Margaret Roper School. We are grateful to the present owners for allowing this to be placed on their property. Our thanks are also due to Polly and Clarissa for all the time and effort. And now, since we are holding up the normal life of this quiet thoroughfare, to the astonishment of the local population, <laughs> I think the moment has arrived for me to perform this very pleasant duty. Before I do so, I would like to introduce you to Luella, who was a pupil at this school. Oh. <laughs> 
she says years and years ago, well, we'll ignore that. <laughs> I hope in future years we will have found more of the pupils, but in the meantime, I think it only appropriate that Luella should help me to unveil, unveil this plant. Right. Hands on, Luella. Kit Gundy was a friend of Eleanor's. I, I knew her, of course, as a small child, but uh, later on when I married, my husband and I had a furniture retail business in Commercial Road, and she found me there. Um, I didn't go to the same church by that time because I'd moved a little further out of town. She found me, and she realised she's still living up here, and she used to do her shopping by taxi. As far as I know, she never owned a car or drove a car. So she used to gather her shopping and bring it to the shop and leave it with me. <laughs> she'd go and do her shopping, then she'd leave it with me, and then she'd pop off back into town, possibly to have lunch or something like that, you know. And a little later on, she'd return. Mm -hmm. And she was, I mean, she was a marvellous person. She used to come rushing down the shop and saying, Oh, Kitty, you are a darling. How are you? Where's my shopping? Taxi's waiting. Must go. And we'd pile her in the <laughs> shopping into the car. And off she'd go. And this became sort of habitual. First time my poor husband saw her, he really wondered what had hit her. But she was in, um, in her manner. She was a very Margaret Rutherford type person, you know? Um, not in appearance, because she was taller. But I mean, he was absolutely petrified. I mean, he took one look at her coming through the door, and he disappeared. <laughs> Didn't appear again until the coast was clear. <laughs> the fans went on to see the sites which inspired the Amishir part of the series. Beth and David Varco had researched a special guidebook. I wanted to know about the Golden Valley, and uh, Helen McClelland did say that the books were written, you know, with, she felt, somewhere around the Peter Church area. But we ought to look uh, at Bow Church as yeah, a starting point. Yeah, but we ought to have point. a look at Bow Church. So uh, Dave came along. I hadn't told him an awful lot about it beforehand, like a lot of the other I'm wives. An, I'm a male interest by marriage, you know, <laughs> as a lot of men are. And uh, so we came to uh, Val Church, and it was just wonderful. We, we just seemed to meet the people who gave us the information. And when we came here, and it, all the text in Eleanor's books fitted exactly, well, we said, this must be, you know, and we'll, we'll work from here. Having found this, everything else falls into place. And I read all the... Golden Valley books and took every piece of information out that could be used for directions for us. And having, sort of of, having established this as the school, it was then easy to take Gay Lambert's escape when uh, she went on to meet her, her half brother uh, from here and also um, Gwenzie's uh, disappearance into the hedge where she disappeared for 24 hours. Um, we even found that in the place. So. And, and the, where the bog was, up, which is, she actually She didn't introduce that, in actually, the, here. She introduced that down on the, the island. island books. But that information was here. We just, <laughs> we just get a buzz from it, really. We get a buzz from it. That's and, it, what we do for fun. So we really, find it you know. exciting. And, and when the pieces of jigsaw sort of fit in to the picture, then, well, it, it's just exciting. It really is. Jenny and Rachel Davis joined the group on Saturday afternoon. Jenny was a member of the original Chalet Club, but let her membership lapse when she went to high school. Although I carried on reading children's stories, it wasn't something that, well, I actually admitted. You did it on the sly. You walked into a, into a bookshop, you sidled towards the children's books, pretending that you were choosing for someone else and one stood there and read for half an hour or so and finally, very guiltily, put the books down. <laughs> it's only recently I've been able to actually um, go back because to them. Because of me? Because of you, yes. <laughs> very much because, because of you. Because then you can pretend you're choosing for me. Oh, yes, it's marvellous. <laughs> and it's marvellous to be able to say, what do you think about Miss Annesley? What do you think about Joey? It's lovely to be able to choose them and not to have to be guilty any longer. <laughs> Do you remember the bit about those snails going up the window? Mm. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. And when, she, I think she's her girl, isn't she, when the baby voodoo... Oh, baby voodoo's fantastic, yes. <laughs> Is that to get rid of the matron? 
Mm. Mm. As well as the snails. Well, I think the snails were And the Shakespeare was to get rid of Matron. Or oh, was it? Mm. Oh, that's right. Yes, they had to go around reading up Shakespeare for weeks and weeks, didn't they? And then they got told off. Mm. Fans spent the evening at Belmont Abbey Monastery and Boys' School, where some of them were staying. First came a quiz, with contestants matched into teams to find which knew the most about Eleanor's work. One keen contender was Sue Sims. Sue owns more than 1,500 girls' school stories and co-edits the fanzine Folly. Is it this one that starts Joey, Joey Bettany? For 12 years now, Joey Maynard plumped herself down, etc., etc. But we only need the identity. Yeah, we do. OK, yeah. fair enough. This is a dreadful confession to make. I think I would have been very miserable at the Shelley School or any other boarding school. Partly the emphasis on what can one say, a rather Spartan existence, those cold baths and those long walks that they're always taking. And those are common to all boarding schools, as far as I can gather. It's not just the Shelley School. Much more because I am miserably aware that as a social animal, I fail totally. And I would far rather be sitting in a library somewhere reading than playing or talking or asking impertinent questions. In fact, the single character, I would say, with whom I identify most strongly in all the books is Eustacia. And Eustacia before she reforms. After she reforms, she becomes a fairly standard shally girl. We don't see very much of her at all until she becomes Dr. Benson and the great authority on Aeschylus. But in her early days, yes, I would have sneaked if anybody had pulled my hair. And I would have sneaked if I got the chance, if I'd seen people wasting their time playing noughts and crosses. And I couldn't see why I shouldn't use any library it took my fancy to, to use. So, enormous sympathy with Eustacia. But, overall, despite this, the Shelley School I loved because it was, of course, a wish fulfillment. The girls who went there, as I knew I would have gone there, unpopular, disliked, out of things. By the end of the book, they were in things. There is no disguising the fact that Eustacia Benson yes. was the most arrogant little freak that ever existed. Yes. That's very That's good. That's who she The evening finished with a formal dinner at the Abbey. Speakers included Luella Hamilton, an old girl of the Margaret Roper School. If you've seen the building where I went to school, those of you who are there today, you will appreciate it wasn't a bit like the Shallow School. <laughs> it was much smaller, for one thing, and in the centre of a town. There was no gym, no laboratory, no playing fields, as far as I can remember. I just remember the garden. But that garden was huge, as I remembered it. And that was where we did plays in the summer. And I seem to remember strawberries and cream teas at some stage, but that was a bit vague. But Miss Brent Dyer did try to instill into us the sort of values that were important at the Chalet School. Loyalty, obedience, pride in achievement, integrity, and being helpful to others. She was musical and played the cello, and she hated slang. <laughs> Two other snippets of information you might like to know. I was at school at the same time as Princess Tsiga Maria, who was the granddaughter of Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. She was a small six to my lofty 12, and so I didn't know her very well. And also, I was the youngest shepherd in that nativity play <laughs> mentioned in Ellen and I actually wore a sack. <laughs> and finally, to put all the foregoing into context, and I'm sure BD would have approved of that. Um, just before Easter this year, I went to see the film Schindler's List, which you might know is about the Holocaust, and I suddenly realized that while I was living quite a nice life here in Hereford, dreadful things were happening in Europe. And so, on a serious level, I would ask you, when you go to your church services tomorrow, to spare a thought for the six million who didn't survive, and but for the grace of God, I could have been one of them. Perhaps Miss Brent Dyer's greatest virtue was her tolerance and lack of prejudice. Thank you, thank you, Miss Brent Dyer, 
And thank you, wonderful Centenary, Centenary Committee, for amazing and impressive organisation this weekend. And thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Nineteen twenty four was arguably the most important year in Eleanor's life because that was the year she decided to visit the Austrian Tyrol and to spend her summer holiday at the beautiful lakeside village of Pertisau on the Achensee. Had she decided to go elsewhere that summer, it is possible the Shelley School would never have existed because unquestionably it was Pertisau and the Achensee which inspired the series. Not only did they provide a notably attractive and fun location for the series, but Eleanor's memories of that Tyrolean holiday undoubtedly coloured her imagination and her whole approach to the series, even when the Shelley School had eventually, for various reasons, to be relocated elsewhere. Long ago, when I was a child and first read the books, I never thought that Eleanor's Brizau am Tiernsee was a real place, but in 1950, when I was staying in Austria with my mother, I made an amazing discovery. We were staying in Innsbruck, and I was struggling through a local guidebook, my German not being quite as good as Joey Bettany's, when the name Scholastica leapt out at me. That's a place that's frequently mentioned in the early books, and further breathless research with a map revealed other familiar place names, Geisong, Buchau, Seespitz, and so on, all grouped round a lake that wasn't called the Tiernsee, but the Achensee. And there, in exactly the right situation beside this lake, was a village reached, just as in the stories, by mountain railway and lake steamer, called, not Brisa, but Pertisau. It had to be right. Despite those altered names, everything fitted. And to my great joy, I had discovered that the original site of the Shelley School really did exist. Or, I should say, really does exist. Later, in the 1970s, I was lucky in having six immensely enjoyable family holidays in Pertisau. And it was in following the footsteps of the Shelley School girls round the Achensee district that my plans for a biography of Eleanor Brent Dar began slowly to take shape. For although no directly personal records of Eleanor's visit have survived, in reading the early Shelley School books it's possible to picture everything about her holiday. The wonderful beauty of the mountain scenery comes through in every chapter. The chalet beside the lake where she and her holiday companion Lillian had stayed the many ways in which they and the other two friends, whose names appear in the dedication to the school at the Shelley, the many ways they had occupied their time. Above all the atmosphere of enjoyment and friendship, it's all there in the books. And today, a commemorative plaque outside the parish church in Pertisau rightly acknowledges the importance of Pertisau and the Achensee in inspiring Eleanor's Shelley School series. They come down to here twice. Daphne Barfoot founded the first modern chalet school newsletter, the Shalitian. In May, she took a group of her readers to visit the lake where it all began. I started the Shalitian, it was about three years ago, and that was through the Abbey Chronicle. I heard about the Abbey Chronicle by accident and joined that. And then I found that people who were writing in that about the Abbey books quite often said, well, of course, I really like the Shelley School books better. And so I wondered if there was a place for an English Shelley School club. And so I started it and I advertised it through the Chronicle and then Folly put an advertisement in. And I believe that somebody put it in the book and magazine collector at one point because one or two people came from there. And then it was word of mouth, and I've got about 100 subscribers now. Because I started the magazine, I said, would anybody be interested in going on a trip to Arkansas? And seven of us went two years ago, and then I planned this trip for the centenary. Although at the time when I planned it, I didn't realize that it was the centenary of the author's birth, but I did know that it was the 70th anniversary of her first visit to Austria. I think for those who have come for the first time, they've probably got the same kind of thrill as I had when I came for the first time, the excitement of, of seeing the places and being somewhere you've never been before and yet knowing the geography. 
when I first came, I found it very exciting knowing where the steamers went, knowing the route, and um, knowing that there was probably the dripping rock between Petersau and Geisam and so on. And it was very strange knowing the geography of somewhere you've not been to. And I think for people who've been before, it's probably interesting being with a group so that one can compare notes and quote and talk about the characters in the books. I think it's because it's exciting to realize that they're real places, because so many books are purely fiction, and here you've got somewhere that although the distances have been changed and the names have been changed, it is about a real place, and so you can, you can almost pretend the thing is real, and you can say, well, this is where they did that, this is where they got caught in the, in the storm on the, the elm and this is where they went to pan for gold in the Zillow and, and so on and it, it somehow gives the books more reality and as some of us were saying yesterday that we almost uh, felt like being old girls at the chalet school. They went down to Sparts by the funny little mountain train which crawls up the side of the mountain from the plain below to the great Tiental. With Madge were the seniors. Miss Maynard and Miss Carthew had the middles and Mamselle, Miss Durrant and Miss Wilson looked after the babies. Mari and Eigen had come to help carry the baskets, and they were as excited as the rest. They sat in awed silence at first, but gradually their tongues were loosened, and they chatted eagerly about the beauties of the journey. From Sparts, the Zillatal winds its way by the banks of the river into the heart of great mountains, where the highest are covered with snow all the year round. Past beautiful woods, the train wound by farmhouses, the walls of which were adorned with wonderful frescoes, and from which linty-locked children appeared to watch the train as it went past. They stopped at primitive little stations. Fugen and Ride and Zell and Zilla were the railway branches off to the east, and so at last to Myrofon. Anne Thompson started reading the books when she took over her daughter's collection. I think the thing what I feel about Reptile's books is a feeling of security, a safe background. No matter what happens, everything always ends up happily. And it's also um, a time and a place that is familiar. You go, you go back, each time you start another book, you go back into her world and you recognize the same things, the dormitories with their baton curtains and the classrooms and the people. And there's a sense of continuity I think, too, it's um, the period in which she wrote is recognisable to me. It's similar to the schools that I went, where things like posture and good manners and speaking quietly and walking along corridors without talking. When I was at school, we had to always process along the walls of the corridor between the classrooms so that staff could walk down a little. Somebody in one of the magazines said that you didn't knock on the staff room door. You stood and you waited till somebody came out and then you could ask if you had a message or a query. And that was very like the school to which I went. And I suppose too, I'm you know, like her Catholicism because I was a Catholic in a school where there, there were only about three of us out of about I suppose 500, and we were a little clique of our own, a little collection of people with similar thoughts and similar ideas. In fact, Joey would now be a little older than I am. She'd be 70, wouldn't she? So Joey would be older than I am. But she, well, she never really grew up. And she never went grey. Her hair was black until the end of the books, as far as I know. She didn't age. The eternal schoolgirl. The girls streamed away to the woods, determined to make the most of their holiday. There was little fear of them getting lost, but they had decided to keep to the banks of the river and see where it led them. Joey and Frida sauntered off up the river, anxious to see as much of it as they could. Elizabeth and Simone crossed to the other bank and wandered along in the other direction. They were presently joined by Margia, 
who had great ideas of finding gold in the water. Simone was delighted to help with the experiments, but Elisabetta soon tired of messing about in the water and went off by herself, full of her own thoughts. She never noticed how far she was getting away from everyone, and it was quite a shock to her when she heard footsteps, and on looking up saw a tall, dark man approaching her with a smile. The stranger seemed to be anxious to prevent her from feeling alarmed, for before she could open her mouth to call, he spoke, making a low bow. Pardon, madame, he said. It is our little princess, is it not? Australian Rosemary Alkmooty now lives in London. In 1992, she published A World of Girls, the first academic study of girls' school stories. Well, of course, I have spent 20 years, or indeed 30 years, trying to work out what appealed to me in the books. And uh, one did have to defend it even in those days, because it was an unusual taste for an Australian teenager in the 60s. But um, I think, obviously, there were all the things that everyone talks about. The exotic setting was very nice. Um, the sense of you know, European history and, and scenery and so on that was so different from what I experienced. But my argument has been, um, certainly ever since I became a feminist, that what I liked about them was that it was um, a world of women and girls uh, where you could you could actually be yourself without having to worry about boys and the pressures of heterosexual society, which were very strong in the 60s and, uh, and early 70s for teenage girls. And I think I used, used them as a form of escapism, as of course people do use fiction, but I used them to escape into a world that, where women could be anything and do anything and where women friends counted, um, because that was not very easy to find in real life in those days. Or indeed, it still isn't. Yes, and those are the meadows full of headlines. They must be unique. I think the experience of 1994 has shown that. Um, the huge gathering at, at Hereford, the huge readership of the Friends of the Shelley School newsletter and Daphne's Shalation as well. Um, I mean, I think most of us have had the experience of feeling we were the only ones or one of only a few people we knew who were interested in these books, who, who cared about them passionately. And then to discover there's not others, but hundreds all over the world, I think is really quite amazing. And that this number is being added to, because these books are selling at the rate of 100 or 150,000 a year, some of those, I mean, many of those, it must be to, to, to kids nowadays, is really amazing. I think Eleanor Brent Dyer's never had her due, and this is, of course, because she's a woman writer, writing for girls, and no one's interested in those. Um, children's literature, women's literature, women's fiction regarded as trivial, negligible, not worth bothering about. But, of course, in literary terms, that makes her very important, and the book's very important. And I would argue that in sociological terms, they're also very important. Um, because they probably have given girls and women, and they probably still do give girls and women, wider horizons and a sense of alternatives to the dominant culture that they might not get anywhere else. I've been to Pertizar once before, but it was a long time ago, and in the winter, and only for one day. I like the Alps, because I went to Switzerland last year and uh, spent some time at, you know, in the area where the, the Swiss Chalet School books were set. What I found, in fact, in coming was that uh, I very much enjoyed getting to know the other women, some of whom, of course, I met at Hereford, and that, that was helpful, a helpful introduction, and also through the London branch of the Friends of the Chalet School. I've enjoyed the walking. I mean, I, now that I, li I, I enjoy walking, I didn't realize there was so much and that I would do so much, and that's been fabulous. And I guess, really, it was the sense, it's, it's again, it's the all women thing. I actually really appreciate that. It's uh, being with a group of women with whom perhaps I don't have a lot in common otherwise. But we have got this really enormous bond, of this kind of shared history, almost, um, over years and years and years, just based on the Shelley School books, because um, they're very real to all of us.
At this point, the girls might break ranks and walk as they chose, so long as they did not get either too far ahead or loiter. Tekla was left with Vanna and Frido, who looked at each other. Both wanted to set this very unpleasant new girl right, and both were rather shy about doing it. But Frida, though she was quiet and very backward about coming forward, as Joey had once phrased it, was also very conscientious. May I say something to you, Tekla? She asked in her soft, pretty voice. Speech is free, said Tekla coldly. I know, but you may not like what I wish to say. Only I think that if I do not, someone in your form may, and perhaps not so nicely. Tekla looked at her scornfully. Do you think I care for anything those girls may say? Those girls, many of whom come from the trading classes. Yes, that is it, said Frida, seizing on this opening. It is this, Tekla. We never trouble about what our fathers are. The thing we think of is what we ourselves are. Drop all these foolish ideas and become one of us. In June, Friends of the Chalet School organised an exhibition in Edinburgh. Our original idea was the London uh, Bethnal Green Museum of Childhood, but eventually Edinburgh was chosen as the location. They have the Museum of Child and Childhood, and of course there's a very strong EBD connection with Edinburgh because W.R. Chambers, her main publishers, um, were then and are still located in Edinburgh. We started to think about the sort of things that we would want in the exhibition and to make a list. And we put a note in the newsletter asking for things. Fortunately, between us, Jill Bilski and myself have all the books, um, except for some of the, the very rare ones with d dust wrappers. And in fact, nobody actually came forward to say that they had any of those. So the books were, were ours. Um, we had a couple from other people. We wanted to show as many of the different dust wrappers and different editions as possible. And we also wanted old ephemera um, and new stuff. There's been quite a lot of things which have been created, such as a tapestry by Lillian Smith, um, various bits of China. We had photographs of, of Hereford the recent weekend we'd had there. And from of the old stuff, we had a lot of things that Chambers had sent to the members of the original Chalet Club back in the 1960s, and even things like school reports from the Margaret Roper School, um, and somebody lent a, a hat band, um, somebody else lent an old school tie from there. We were lucky enough to have some original artwork, um, re really representing all the periods of, of the Chalet illustrations, from one of the early Nina K. Brisley illustrations through to a, a dust wrapper by Dee Brook, the one from the Chalet School reunion, and then finally some of the new paperback artwork by Gwyn Jones. And it all, it all really ran extremely smoothly. On the 11th of June, Scottish fans met in Edinburgh to see the exhibition. Lillian Smith had created one of the exhibits. The tapestry, well, I got the idea actually from a previous, another collection of books. Somebody de uh, designed a tapestry for that, so I thought I would like one for the Charlie books. And I deliberately made it in the, a different type of design, more a sampler in squares rather than active, to be different than the tapestry from another group of books. And I tried to depict every book in the series so that there is an incident occurring from all of the, the Shelley books. Though, of course, some of the things have to be used more than once. <laughs> and I tried to depict the main characters. And the border is the flags which depict characters or areas where where places are mentioned, because the school was international. People came from all over the world, and so I used this. It's beautiful. It's got everything. Can you not work out what it is? Well, most of them have got one. Oh, oh, this one. The snake. I want the black snake. A snake, A revolver. Uh, yes. From the timeline. Um, um, red heads. Yes. Red heads. 
Yeah, well, the, the snake is the leader. Remember from the snake, Jack, Jack missed somebody off from the desk to the snake. But there's something that Andrew is yeah. yeah. Every book is represented with some of the, the things they used to do. Uh -huh. yeah. I did it with the way up. Are you ever going to let anyone else have the pattern for it? There's about 30, about 40 people about the party. I was glad to be able to share it with others, though it's not terribly well done, it's only my second attempt, but uh, yes, I was, I was quite happy to have it on show so that others could see, see about the shower book, and I know there's so many people interested in handiwork now, and to show that this is an interest that actually I got through collecting books. I had never done anything like this before I started to collect books, so this was something to show that it's, it's more than just reading the books, you've got so many interests with handwork as well as people. Later fans met at a nearby arts centre. Well, I'm Ben Crosby and um, I organise a local group in Edinburgh and I started it last summer when Polly and Clarissa were first coming up to start organising centenary things and I just circulated everybody with a letter asking if they um, wanted to meet up and we have grown from I think about 10 the first time to the number who are here today. Not everybody who's here today is local. There are some people actually come from London today, <coughs> Shirley Skinner for instance. Um, but we meet once every three months. Usually it's the evening. Um, today is different because we thought we would try a daytime meeting for once and it seems to be very successful. We do all sorts of things, we have quizzes sometimes. At Christmas we had a quiz with prizes, which is a thinly disguised excuse for giving Christmas presents. And um, we have had swapping books around, we have had um, just talking about dealers and um, other clubs like Folly, that kind of thing. But really it's mainly a social thing. And, Despite what the reporter from Scotland on Sunday asked me when she rang, you to ask them about local clubs. We do not dress up as schoolgirls and go to public places. So she seemed to think this is what we do, but no, we don't. No, we don't. Bean picture. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. The Shelley School's happy years in Tyrrell were brought to an enforced ending by the Nazi annexation of Austria. This event, in real historical time, took place in March 1938 and it thus had already happened several weeks before the publication of the 13th Shelley School book, The New Shelley School. And that must have caused an immediate dilemma for Eleanor and her publishers, because not only had that 13th book left the Shelley School happily established in Austria, it seems likely, bearing in mind Eleanor's track record, that by this time she would already have planned, if not part written, a 14th book, still using the Tyrolean background. And now, clearly, the international situation from 1938 onwards ruled out this possibility, especially with Hitler's Germany becoming ever more threatening, something of which Eleanor seems to have been more aware than many others of her generation. In any case, Eleanor had specifically Shelley School problems of her own at this time. For what role was she to find for her pivotal character, Joey Bettany, who was now irrevocably past school age, though still reluctant to be considered a full grown up. In the end, Eleanor tackled all the problems head on, and in making full use of the international crises, she wrote what would prove to be one of her most popular books, The Shelley School in Exile. Here, as well as relating the perils endured by Joey, with Jack Maynard, Miss Wilson, and a group of Chalettians during their hazardous escape from Austria into Switzerland, the story also describes how the many harrowing events accelerate the maturing of Joey's character. And this does make it possible for the reader to accept that in the course of the book, Joe becomes first engaged, then married, and in the later chapters, the mother of triplet daughters. Meanwhile, both Joey and the Shelley School find new, if only temporary, homes in another of Eleanor's favourite places, the Channel Island of Guernsey, which she had, of course, visited in 1923, the year before her Tyrolean holiday, and where she had set a number of her Lara Shell stories. That's her other series. 
And in bringing the, the Shelley School to Guernsey, Eleanor enjoyed an opportunity of linking her two series by welcoming a number of the La Rochelle characters into the Shelley School. In September, more than 30 fans spent the weekend on Guernsey. Well, I think we, we thought of Guernsey really because she didn't just write the Shelley School books. Um, one of the other series she wrote was a, a set of seven loosely connected books known as the La Rochelle series, five of which are either wholly or partly set in Guernsey. And there are also two of the Chalet books which are, have, um, well, the Chalet School in Exile has its second half in, in Guernsey, and the Chalet School Goes to It has a chapter mm -hmm. and a half in Guernsey. And it seemed a very obvious place to choose. Um, it's also obviously an attractive island and somewhere very nice to go. It was uh, quite gratifying to know that some people were coming on this trip who never actually read the La Rochelle series, but if you like, the chalet spirit had pervaded all the things we'd done so far for Centenary Year. They'd, they'd had such good times meeting with other like-minded individuals, and they wanted to be part of it again and discover the La Rochelle country for themselves. All your gosh is ordered, but would you, how many want tea? Uh, me. Mo Everett helped organise the weekend. Well, I rediscovered bread dye when I came over to Guernsey. We was working in the grammar school, and they were throwing out old books. And I'd been working in there, and I had re started to reread them. And they were throwing out uh, first edition New Chalet School and um, one of the Chalet School for Girls, Volume Two. So I thought, oh, well, I'll keep those. And then I had no idea how I was going to get hold of any other hardbacks. So I started to buy the paperbacks. My daughter started to read them. She was 10 then. Fell in love with them. Then I discovered another hardback in the Oxfam shop. And from then on, she wasn't interested in the paperback. She wanted all the hardbacks. I'd never heard of the La Rochelle series, so I started to collect them. But then I started to find all the different places, take photographs. And then when the celebrations came up and Guernsey was mooted as a place to come, I thought I'd go into a lot more detail. We were out as to establish, for example, where Polly learnt to swim in maids and where they used to fall off the water into the sea, where the, um, the fire was when Peter Degari was killed saving Anne, and so on. And I just worked from the books and got the state's archivist who holds all the um, history, mater history material on Guernsey and we just worked together to hunt up all the places and took it from there. I think the house, is, the house must have either been that antique shop or that antique shop because they're the only ones actually on a corner, uh -huh. all right? And they came up that street to the house or up Fountain Street to the house. Right. So I think it must be, and they're the only ones I think that look I feel that I've joined a very large extended family and I know that wherever I am when I go, go to England that I'm never going to be alone because there's always somebody there that I can call on and go and visit and have a cup of coffee or whatever and drool over their books. Few of the women who wrote school stories can have had Eleanor's experience in the nitty gritty of real school life. Her teaching career had included a surprisingly wide variety of schools, state schools as well as private schools, boarding and day schools. She had even founded and acted as headmistress in her own school, the Margaret Roper School in Hereford, where she had gone to live in 1933. And this school she ran herself for the 10 years between 1938 and 1948. Undoubtedly, Eleanor would have liked her real-life school to resemble the Shelley School, and it's clear that the basic aims and ideals of the two schools did have much in common. Nevertheless, there were, for many reasons, wide differences. And although the Market Rover School undoubtedly filled a local need during the war years, it never enjoyed the phenomenal success of its fictional rival. Nor was Eleanor, for all her undoubted gifts as a teacher, really suited to being a headmistress. Her main interest throughout the years had always lain in her writing. And after the Margaret Roper School closed in July 1948, Eleanor's writing output increased dramatically, the record period being the decade immediately following, which saw the production of 38 books. 
including 23 additions to the Shelley School series. This level was never quite reached again, but during the following 11 years, Eleanor managed to produce a further 18 Shelley School books in an effort to satisfy her fans. This was a highly successful time for Eleanor in career terms, although in many ways her life cannot have been easy. For one thing, she was still struggling to maintain the enormous Victorian villa in Hereford, which had housed her school. And it wasn't until 1964 that her friends, Phyllis and Sidney Matthewman, finally persuaded her to sell up and to move with them into a far more manageable house at Red Hill in Surrey. It was here that Eleanor spent the last five years of her life, and here that she died, quite suddenly and very peacefully, on the 20th of September, 1969. She had continued working on the Shelley School books right up to the day before her death. And the final book of the series, Prefects of the Shelley School, was in fact to be published posthumously in March 1970. The day after fans returned from Guernsey, they gathered in Surrey for a final tribute to Eleanor. Well, I think as we'd begun with Eleanor's birth, we wanted to end with her death. Um, and it was really when we discovered that she'd been buried without a headstone that we felt that something should be done to rectify this. And then when we were working things out, we realized that the 20th of September 1994 would be exactly 25 years to the day after she died. And so it seemed a fitting time to choose we put a note in the newsletter asking people whether they would be interested in donating money towards a headstone and perhaps coming to a service on, on that day. And we had a, a very good response, so we just took things from there. Speakers at the service included Chloe Rutherford, Ellen Azair. Ellen Red Dyer was an intimate friend of my family for many years. I can remember her clearly from my youth and have a vivid picture of her from many family, out family outings, uh, visits to Hereford where she lived. To a youngster, her outward physical appearance was rather daunting. The ample figure with its strong arms and shoulders the deep, sometimes gruff voice, the face of unmistakable authority, made her someone who appeared, if not severe, then certainly an imposing and dominant presence. A heavyweight Thor Robson with the nearest hint of a twinkle in the eyes. Well, that should give you an accurate picture. It took me quite some time to realize that this was the outward mask of the working headmistress. Behind that facade lurked a complex, single-minded, lovable, clumsy, stubborn, forward-looking, spiritual, dotily humoured personality of enormous charm and innate wisdom. With hindsight, I can now recognise a born educator, someone who almost whooped for joy and enthusiasm at the chance of encouraging and opening a young mind. As I came to realise, this was no old-fashioned fuddy-duddy, but a very kind and generous one a mine of information and a fount of common good sense. May I just finish by saying personally, thank you, Eleanor. God bless you. We chose a, a Hereford stonemason just to carry on the EBD connection. Kept the inscription very simple. Um, we wanted to show that it was donated by the fans, so we chose to use the Friends of the Shalley School logo on the gravestone above the simple inscription um, to convey that a lot of fans still have a love for that author and just to give a very fitting tribute to her. It's the characters. And they all seem to have such a marvellous time. 
and they've always got happy endings. I hate books that haven't got happy endings. <laughs> but I think the, the books for me as a child, I mean, I, everybody had their place in the Shirley School, nobody was disapproved of. And they were understanding teachers. Well, our teachers were okay, but they weren't understanding. They were there to teach. And they had nice uniforms that suited them. Well, our uniform was grey and white and didn't suit me. And everybody had, so everybody had their place. It was very hierarchical and very secure. And then, then after I worked in London, and then there were the, the air raids, and the flying bombs, and the rockets. And there's this uh, the very famous quotation, what is death? falling asleep with God to awaken his presence, which sustained me through per periods of danger. And some, some of them weren't imminent, but some were. We all just like the kind of outlook that the books provide. Um, society seems to, in a way, be going down and down at the moment. And a lot of people don't have out my outlook on life. And I seem to think more and more now it's because I've read these books and I wish more people would, because perhaps then things would pick up. Even when I am an old lady with white hair, telling all my great-great-nieces and nephews all about my wicked deeds, I'll never count myself as anything but a Shelley schoolgirl.